right behind me, we have uh, one of the Acropolis of the city of Kiriwa, located uh, 90 kilometers south of the port of Santo Tomas de Castilla in Guatemala. Uh, around the site, you're going to find 15 monuments. Uh, Ten of them are erected. We call them estilas. So morphous are round stones that represent animals. So regardless of the size, they all have a beautiful carving where the hieroglyphic describes the history of the place from 426 AD to the collapse of the city, which was around 820 AD. So by reading the hieroglyph and showing you the scripture, it tells you precisely that this city claim independence from Copan at 738 after having political alliance with the city of Tikal, Calakmul. So what they did here was people brought obsidian to this city. From this city they took jade. So obsidian was processed here and the commercial trading became so big that Kiriwa became one of the only providers of jade in the, in the Mayan world. You can see that the construction of the Acropolis was built on a very extended platform for one specific reason. This is an anti-seismic platform, so that's how we can explain the length of the steps from east to west. So once you climb to the Acropolis, you start seeing the reason why they put an anti-seismic platform is to protect the family of novels that live up in the Acropolis. So it tells you how important it was for them to preserve the life of the rulers, the priests, the astronomers, and the militaries. Compare it to our natives, you sort of say, right, they were far more advanced. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing, and our guide has been fantastic. We learned so much. Never have known half of this if we hadn't had him. Good morning. Welcome to Guatemala. So this morning we're on our inaugural trip in Belize and Guatemala and we are visiting the Mayan archaeological site of Kiriwa. The uh, location of the archaeological site of Kiriwa is surrounded by forests. It's a great place for bird watching, but aside from that, it's a well-known location for the massive stelas that are 35 feet tall and up to 16 tons in weight. A single piece of stone carved with uh, intricate decorations. So we are seeing some of the oldest Mayan ruins. Um, the stelas are these figures you see in the background, uh, which are about uh, eight to 10 meters high, and they have all these hieroglyphics on them that tell pretty interesting stories about how the different Mayan people um, essentially interacted with each other, some of the story of their history, some of the story of their beliefs and religion. We spent one day at sea and one day on land, um, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the journey. This morning during the way going to, to uh, Livingstone, we saw uh, some fishermen. They were catching fish like a manhua, sardines, they catch uh, trims, and they catch around blue crabs at the same time. This is one of the jobs that the local people, they are going to do every day here in, in this part of the country. Yeah. The catch is, is uh, sun-dried with salt, yeah, and this was a... Um, a sardine catch, excuse me, and uh, they spread it out on tarps just like you would do coffee and then they salt it and dry it. Oh, that was more than cool. <laughs> that was very cool. After that we saw the, the fishermen, we passed in from Livingstone. Livingstone is like a small island. The only way to come here is just by boat. There is no ropes to come here. The population who live here, those are Agarinagos, that they arrived here in the 18th centuries. They are a descendant from Jamaica, San Vicente Island in Africa, and they speak Agarifono language, and it's a mix of words, French, English, and Spanish. And then we get inside, we got inside to Rio Dulce, and this river is around 32 kilometers long and start in the biggest lake of Guatemala. There is a lot of birds and also a local community there. There is some places where we stop in need of the lilies garden. We are stopping a beautiful house where we saw how the people they live here, how they do every day. See how the local people they make tortillas here in Guatemala. 
Mira si está en la mesa. Ella es mi nieta, entonces es de ella es mi hija. Okay, ella sí. tiene que decirle tía. Sí. Su tía. Y ella es mi nuera. They are cousins. Muy bueno. <laughs> Ranguana Keys is one of the most southeast islands on the barrier reef of Belize, where you have a bunch of beautiful sandy beaches. If you look around, you'll find conch shells, you'll find coral. Today is a super windy day. It's a good piece of advice just to be aware that might be coconuts just falling around you. How many of you have been seeing a lot of the coconuts around? <laughs> Everywhere, right? Have you ever seen the face of the coconut? The mouth itself is where it holds the embryo. If you want to peel a coconut, if you begin from this section, you will peel forever. Every single palm you see in these areas will be planted. You all remember the movie Castaway? Yes. All right. So everything on that is used. The chicken, the, the, There's the your face. <laughs> remember, every time you see the face, the embryo is right here. Who wants the water? Who wants? <laughs> In the Caribbean side, they love when it has a very thick layer of endosperm. The two eyes right. that, are wash, that are match, but then the embryo is the mouth. The face is always there? Yeah. You can't. <laughs> what is nice about this part is actually the husk plays an important seal. The upper section is hydrophobic, allow them to drift. And oh, wow. So they, that's how they normally colonize the islands. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the coconut trees here are amazing. We had a coconut demonstration that shows us how the coconuts uh, regenerate themselves. Uh, we wouldn't have these opportunities without Nat Geo and Limblad expeditions. So we really appreciate it. It's another beautiful day in Belize and we're here at Southwater Key. Southwater Key is a marine reserve and they put great effort into doing some coral restoration projects. They're taking healthy fragments of coral and transplanting them into non-healthy areas and hoping they will grow and flourish. Belize hosts the second largest barrier reef system in the world and the healthiest largest barrier reef system worldwide. It's great to spend so much time in the underwater world because it hosts a variety of organisms. We see all different types of soft coral like gorgonians and the big purple sea fans. We also have hard corals like the brain corals and the lettuce leaf corals. And of course, we have tons of fish. People travel from all over the world to dive here in Belize and we're truly lucky to be able to experience such a healthy reef. And because the corals are in such good shape, they host a variety of the reef fishes. It also hosts about 250 different fish species. And all of these reef fish have different jobs on the reef. Some of the parrot fish will eat the coral, some are feeding on the plankton, and some are the algae grazers. Our life here on land is so intimately connected with our oceanic life. It's important for us to think about protecting these precious reefs. Not only do we enjoy looking at them, but they provide us food, they provide us water, and they protect our islands with their barrier reef system. I went out into the deep snorkeling area, and out there we saw a, a nurse shark. He was kind of hiding in the, under the coral. I saw angelfish, a lot of angelfish, and some things we didn't know. The guides were really good to point out, you know, what we were to look for. So it was a great experience. Here we are at Laughing Bird Key. Laughing Bird Key is a national park here in Belize. It's unique reef formation known as a pharaoh. And it's important to our country because it is a nursery for juvenile conch and spiny lobster, which are major exports here in Belize. Each visitor is paid. 10 US dollars or 20 Belize dollars conservation fee, which supports the daily maintenance of the national park. We'll be putting the groups into six or eight. All of you are experienced, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We walked down the beach over there and we 
went in with our guide and she took us out and you'd see under all these differently colored areas there are different bits of coral around. The fun thing was she was able to dive down if she saw something that would be hard to see from the surface. We went to an area over there where they're building a nursery basically to regenerate the coral and apparently lots of fish are making their homes in there. So we saw a big barracuda in there, which I was told was a small one. And you watch it change color under the water. It's pristine with the coral life that is around it, particularly the elk horn and stag horn and uh, brain coral and many other species that are very delicate. So we are happy to have an area such as Laughing Bird Key to protect our habitat. It's hard to express how much I love the reef, the life. It's a delicate environment. They don't have a voice and I'm the one that should protect them. It's pretty, it's good to see the reef looks pretty healthy here and we have a place where that's still true. It was really, really, really pleasant. I enjoyed it a lot. The last time I had that much fun snorkeling, I think I was in Belize. Hell, I am in Belize. <laughs> Hello, my name is Patty Ramirez, owner of Splash Dive Center in Placencia, Belize. I try to teach our crew that the little details are the ones that count. Oh, well, why don't I have Rudy? I would have shaved my legs. <laughs> After some time, I realized the help that the local people they need to become professionals. I decide to open a lot of community programs so that the local people could get into tourism. We have six different scholarship programs where the Belizeans could join so they could become dive professionals or just get into tourism. The splash guides have been fabulous. First day out, they helped us really get through some chop and they were right there for us. Today, Rudy was just wonderful. I mean, every time he saw something, he pointed out, we'd get to go down and have a look. It was such a great tour, and he was such a great guy. At the end of the day, since I started guiding, all I want to see is these persons smiling, because, yes, I'm out here every day and I'm blessed to have this job. I got a scholarship to do guiding, so I took it and here I am. To have somebody from Belize share this wonderful experience with all of us, it just was fabulous. Look at all those bottles, wow. Yeah. Wow. Traveling to all these beautiful places around the world, it's important for us to take action to help preserve these areas for future generations. And unfortunately, we end up on some of these beautiful beaches that have all sorts of plastic waste. And worldwide right now, it's estimated that we are producing over 300 million tons of plastic waste each year. And under 10% of that's actually being recycled. So a lot of it's just ending up in our oceans. And not only is it unsightly, but it's causing catastrophic problems to our vulnerable marine ecosystem. So today we're going to do our part and pick up some of the plastic that we are seeing. But it's just important to be mindful that this is actually not solving the problem. We're simply just putting a bandage on a big underlying issue. So it's good to remove it right now so the marine organisms aren't eating it or hopefully preventing casualties from ingestion and suffocation. So we will take this back to the ship and dispose of it properly when we have the chance. 
two bottles right here in the same area. So they were probably each used just for a few minutes and then tossed out and they have ended up on our beach. And since they don't biodegrade, they are here forever. So we're gonna take them and dispose of them properly. But this is the reason why on the Lindblad Expedition's National Geographic ships, we have stopped using plastic water bottles and we have moved to reusable ones that we provide to all the guests. And we'll just bring big containers of water to shore so we can refill our reusable water bottles. But I would definitely agree with Shaylin that while it's, it is helpful and it does make you feel good to pick things up at the beach, it's really important to be mindful that how you use plastics and how you dispose of plastics. Because if it isn't in the ocean to begin with, then that's going to mean fewer and fewer people have to comb these beaches and pick up pick the plastic. Up. So it's really important to think about the choices you have in front of you of how you use plastic and how you uh, dispose of it. Over the past few weeks, we've been picking up the trash we've seen on the beach. So it's great to come back and see the difference.